Pauline sitting up here, I think I sound better than I do when I sing, but it's really her I'm hearing. <laughs> if you want to know the master, observe the student. Our speaker this morning was taught and trained by a master in the principles of truth whose life was her message. He is her able student and a teacher of note in his own right. Please join me in welcome to, welcoming to the podium our staff minister, Reverend Michael Record. Thank you so much, Sharon. Good morning, friends. A warm welcome to you here at the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica, and also to those listening to me online. Before I get into my talk proper, I have a little preamble. For thousands of years, man has known that there is a spirit some force that is guiding him. This morning, just as I was preparing to meditate, I do what I usually do. I pick up a creative thought. And I turned, just by random, I just opened the book, by random, I turned to Reverend Carol Lynch of New York's treatment for that day. And when I read it, I realized that key words in that treatment are the key words in the talk that I had been preparing all week. I didn't think of that as coincidental. I thought of it as guidance. This has happened to me many, many times before. I'm sure that every single one of you here has had that sort of thing happen to you. You set your intention, you set out on a particular journey, you want to do something, and you find that something is helping you, assisting you to move in the direction that you intended to go. So when I read this, I said, is it guiding me? Is it, it just happened to be in line with the talk that I had written? Or is it a guidance for somebody in the congregation or, or, or on the internet? And I meditated, while I was meditating, it came to me that it may well be a message as it were, some sort of guidance for somebody listening to me. So I thought before my talk, I would read the, the treatment. The epigraph is by Dr. Ernest Holmes and is from the textbook, The Science of Mind. If this resonates with you, then perhaps it was for you. There is a place in us which lies open to the infinite. But when the spirit brings its gifts by pouring itself through us, it can give to us only what we take. So that's one message. Reverend Carol Lynch writes this treatment. I am open to the infinite. There is one universal intelligence, life force, and source back of all creation, that is spirit. Recognizing there is a power for good in the universe, this power is infinite in its expression and its unfolding action of perfect intelligence. This intelligence operates through me moment by moment. It sustains and maintains me in the perfect expression of life and within its divine embrace. Divine intelligence makes itself available in my ability to think clearly and to make right decisions. I give expression to that which is infinite and boundaryless to create in my life. 
I release any thoughts of limitation. I accept my greatness. I know the truth of me is only good. I expect the best, and I graciously receive the best. Out of the divine givingness, the greater abundance of good flows to me. There is more love, more health, more financial freedom, and more joy in living. It is the divine in action as me, and I rejoice in knowing that this is the truth. Life is not limited. I open myself for the taking and joyous re joyously receive spirit's gifts. This is the way it is. I am ever grateful. I release my word to the law, and so it is. Now, my talk. Humans have four fundamental needs. We need and want physical health, abundance, meaning enough money and material stuff to live comfortably. Good relationships with those around us, that's family, friends, and acquaintances. And fourthly, we need to express ourselves. This morning, I'm looking at self-expression, and my talk is titled, How to Shine. The Bible refers to self-expression as letting our light shine instead of hiding it under a bushel. In case you're wondering what a bushel is, it is equal to four pecks. <laughs> or a container that can hold four pecks. I looked it up for you, and I hope that helps. <laughs> and those of you who want to know what a peck is, it is a fourth of a bushel. <laughs> The need to express who we are is the need, the need, we share with God. We don't share the others. God doesn't need health or abundance or good relationships with others. For God is health and abundance, and there are no others aside from God to have relationships with. But God wanted or needed, for with God wanting and needing are the same thing. God needed to express itself. How? By doing what it does best, creating. Man has always known that God, by its very nature, is creative. Thus, the first verse of the Bible tells us, in the beginning, God created. I continue. God created the heaven and the earth. That's the universe. Indirectly, science tells us the same thing, but without using the word God. Science don't like to use the word God. It tells us that the physical universe was not always there and had a beginning. That's about 13.7 billion years ago. Using logic, which is scientific, we figure out that before the universe, before matter, there was something that was not matter, because something can't come out of nothing. Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of, religious science, of our religious science movement, says we live in a spiritual universe containing a physical universe. So what was before the physical universe was universe was a creative spiritual universe. And we have named it. What have we named that creative spiritual universe? God. So God created in order to express itself. And we, being made in the image and likeness of God, also naturally, instinctively, seek to self-express. So what I just gave you was the answer to the question, why do we want or need to self-express? It comes naturally. 
Now we can ask two other questions. What do we express and how do we express? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us that we express the gifts given to us by spirit. That phrase was in the treatment I just read. In that chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, that chapter of his letter to the people of Corinth in verses 12 to 28, St. Paul has a very neatly argued essay in which he makes an analogy between the human body and the church, which he calls the body of Christ. The essay ends with a list of the gifts of spirit given to Jews, Gentiles, slaves, and free persons, which covers just about everybody. Paul says, and I'm quoting the words of the New International Version of the Bible, we were all given the one spirit to drink. I love the pun. <laughs> something, spirit is something we drink. Paul continues. No, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the, in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If there were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be the weakest are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. I confess, I'm a little puzzled by that verse. Somebody explained to me later what less than honorable and unpresentable parts of the body he's talking about. I don't know. <laughs> yes, Reverend John, come to foundation classes. But Paul continues, God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Here is the bit where he lists the gifts of spirit. I'm quoting again. In the church, God has appointed first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing. I look at Howard over there. Those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, Reverend John, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues, unquote. It could be a lesson, I think, in self-discovery if you ask yourself which of those gifts you have. To help you, I want to compare that list of 2,000 years ago with Harvard University professor Howard Gardner's 20th century list of human intelligences. Gardner defines intelligence as, I quote, the capacity to solve problems 
or to fashion products that are valued in one or more cultural settings." Unquote. And I must thank Wikipedia for this list coming and explanation of Gardner's seven basic human intelligences. One, linguistic intelligence. That's sensitivity to spoken and written language, the ability to learn languages, and the capacity to, to use language to accomplish certain goals. This intelligence includes the ability to effectively use language to express oneself rhetorically or poetically, and language as a mean to remember information. Writers, poets, I'm looking at my sister. Lawyers, Lorna, and speakers are among those having high ling linguistic intelligence. Right, Norman? Two, logical mathematical intelligence consists of the capacity to analyze problems logically carry out mathematical operations, and investigate issues scientifically. Whereas, Lily, there are scientists among us. It entails the ability to direct patterns, reason deductively, and think logically. This intelligence is associated with scientific and mathematical thinking. Three, musical intelligence. This involves the skill in performance, composition, and appreciation of musical patterns. It encompasses the capacity to recognize and compose musical pitches, tones, and rhythms. Maestro will add a whole lot of other things, I'm sure. Musical intelligence runs in an almost structural parallel to linguistic intelligence that I found rather curious. If you're musical, you tend to be also linguistically intelligent. Hmm. Four, bodily or kinesthetic intelligence entails the potential of using one's whole body or parts of the body to solve problems. It is the ability to use mental abilities to coordinate bodily movements, athletes, Sports people, dancers, and others would be gifted, would be those gifted with bodily intelligence. Number five, spatial intelligence. This involves the potential to recognize and use the patterns of wide space and more confined spaces. Here we're talking about explorers, engineers, architects, interior decorators, flower arrangers, photographers, and the like. Six, interpersonal intelligence. That's the capacity to understand the intentions, motivations, and desires of other people. It helps you to work effectively with others. Educators, salespeople, religious, and political leaders and counselors need strong interpersonal intelligence. And number seven, the last of the basic in human intelligences, intrapersonal intelligence. That's the capacity to understand oneself, to appreciate one's feelings, fears, and motivation. It involves having an effective working model of ourselves and being able to use such information to regulate our lives. People with good intrapersonal intelligence would be counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, and again, poets. So that's Howard Gardner's list. Of course, all of us have combinations of these intelligences. Some of, the, some of us are exceptionally gifted in one or two, maybe even three of them. Now, that list of gardeners is not complete. It's just of the basic intelligences, and Gardner admits that there are other intelligences. Which of those intelligences would you say you're strongest in? 
And then if you added Paul's list to Gardner's list, would it give you a useful tool for identifying your talents? I see some overlap of the two lists. I'd say, this is how I interpret it, I'd say Gardner's intrapersonal intelligence, that's the ability to understand your own psychology, equates with what Paul calls the ability to help others. I'd say Gardner's interpersonal intelligence is the same as the gift or relates closely to the gift of administration. And I'd say that linguistic intelligence links, links with what Paul calls the gift of tongues. You can compare the list yourself. Oh, and you can get them online. There's nothing you can't get online these days, even love. I'm asking you, this is what I'm asking you, to find your innate talent or talents. The inmates of the general penitentiary who Reverend John and I have been teaching truth to for the past year and a half, we find have all different gifts and want to express themselves differently. It's interesting to see how many of them have discovered their talents in prison. If they had not gone to prison, we have repeatedly heard, they would not have discovered those talents. Talents for music, for teaching, for counseling, for writing. Writing, some write philosophical stuff, some write poetry. More metaphysically, many of them have discovered themselves. They know themselves better now. They have developed their intra personal intelligence. I suspect it comes from those long hours from about 4 p.m. to 7 a.m. that they spend by themselves in their cells. Many have discovered how to have a close relationship with God and they are grateful for that discovery. At least one man told us that it was worth going to prison to develop that relationship. Interestingly, Almost to a man, our students are religious. In fact, I believe that man for man, we only have men in the GP, man for man, prisoners are more religious than the general population. Now, there's a paradox for you. And don't think the inmates of the GP that we've been teaching are in for small offenses either, and so it's natural for them to be religious. The GP is no tamarind farm, that prison without walls, with only barbed wires and farms. And our students are in for major crimes and are locked up behind rows and rows of 20-foot high walls. Those who have never met our students might think of them as bad men, but the, of the dozens which we have taught, Reverend John and I, we haven't met one person that we would so describe. They have done bad things, yes, but that doesn't mean that they are bad men. And can you say that an action was bad if good comes from it? Like discovering yourself, like discovering a relationship with God. Was it really bad? Hmm. There's a nice philosophical question for you to ponder. Oh, by the way, many of the students that we teach discriminate, discriminate against other prisoners and try not to associate with them. They think they're bad. <laughs> and I don't mean the sex offenders who are kept segregated by the pr prison authorities in a prison within the prison. I mean mainly the newcomers who come in angry, resentful, self-centered, hard ears. These words I get from our, our students. They won't listen to elders, our students tell us. But happily, it seems that after a few years of forced introspection, and even meditation in their cells for 15 hours a day, the toughest of them start to mellow as they get to know themselves. 
and going to classes, and there are two separate school blocks, each with many classrooms in the GP, going to classes also helps them in their discovery, specifically to come back to my talk of their talents. Why do I want you to know your talents or talents? Discovering it helps you to express yourself, the theme of my talk. But just merely discovering your talents is not enough, says British educator Sir Ken Robinson. Do you know the phrase, in your element? You're in your element, some of you do. Robinson wants us to be in our element for maximum self-expression. He wrote a book called the, Ele it, called the Element, which was a bestseller. And he has a talk on YouTube's TED Talks on the book. Which talk is one of the most popular of the TED Talk videos? I urge you to listen to it. It lasts about half an hour. All you need to do is type in The Element by Ken Robinson, and it's there. Here are five of its main points. One, your element is where your natural talent meets your personal passion. Two, most people don't know their true talent and so can't be in their element. Three, being good at something is not a good enough reason to make a career of it. Sir Ken, for example, tells the story of an excellent concert pianist who didn't like playing. So she quit her job to become a book editor, and that she loves. Point number four from the TED Talk. Fear of failure prevents us from trying new things. And five, doing what you love creates opportunities in your life. Sir Ken doesn't use the term, but we know that that last one about the creating of opportunities is the law of attraction at work. For those who are not sure, and I see that there is a newcomer, let me quote Wikipedia again about the law of attraction. It states, I quote, people experience physical and mental manifestations that correspond to their predominant thoughts, feelings, words, and actions, and that people therefore have a direct control over reality and their lives through thoughts alone. A person's thought, conscious and unconscious, emotions, beliefs, and actions are said to attract corresponding positive and negative experiences." Unquote. As I draw to a close, I'll repeat the Marion Williamson quote that you heard Carmen read earlier. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us. It is in everyone. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give people, other people, permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically 
liberates others, unquote. Ken Robinson and Marion Williamson together are saying that you will shine when you are working in your element, when you're doing what you're good at and loving it. And your light will light up and liberate the world. Namaste.